Hello, brothers and sisters. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion Lutheran Church and also on behalf of Bethany Lutheran Church. And we are getting ready for our Easter online Bible study. And I've started a few moments earlier uh, just to give us a chance to gather. So I'm not going to jump into the lesson right away. We just concluded our live radio broadcast of our Easter worship. And that was a joy and a blessing to be able to share the gospel with you and to hear the joyous songs of Easter and resurrection. Of course, it uh, feels a little different from, it do from how it feels in prior years, um, but that doesn't change the objective truth. It doesn't change the objective message that we proclaim that Christ is indeed risen and he is risen in order to redeem the world. He's not risen in order to visit the world with judgment, uh, in the sense of coming back full of wrath to say, you killed me and now I'm going to um, destroy you, you wicked creation for rejecting me. Rather, he comes back with a day of grace, a long time of opportunity for the gospel to be preached. Eons and eons, who knows how long it will be uh, that he'll permit his gospel to be preached so that the whole world may repent and believe and receive the joyous gifts of his salvation. So what we're going to study today, and I see people are beginning to gather. Hello to all of you. Glad that you're here. What we're going to be reading today and studying is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I once, I had a friend who once described 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as uh, the center of the New Testament for him. Now, of course, the, every word in the New Testament is inspired. Every word in the whole Old and New Testaments uh, is inspired and comes from God, is offered by him. But 1 Corinthians 15 does slow down and really unpack uh, both the promise and you might also say the physics of resurrection. Uh, in the course of unpacking the promise of resurrection, St. Paul, who wrote the letter, the first letter to the Corinthians, and the second one too, but uh, we're, we're in 1 Corinthians, uh, St. Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth, in the course of unpacking the promise of the resurrection, he also dwells a little bit on what will the resurrection be like for us. Since Jesus rose in his flesh, the promise is you also, we in the church, we who have believed in Christ, will rise in the flesh. Actually, all of creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and all the dead will be raised, and then those who believe in Christ granted eternal life. So, what is that going to be like? What's that going to feel like? The Corinthians wanted to know. And St. Paul does slow down enough. I mean, St. Paul had so many things he wanted to accomplish. He was always on a, a really fast-paced agenda. But he slows down enough to dwell on that question for the Corinthians, at least enough to give them a few answers, to give them the answer God had given him to share. Uh, recently, I was I was reading the Bible to my son, my youngest son, and uh, when we got done reading that particular Bible story, I forget how he asked the question, but whatever question he asked, he gave the he he said, uh, "Is that the way it works in heaven?" And we said, "Well, we said the story we just read. That's not in heaven. That's on earth." And he said, "On earth?" He said, "I thought all these stories happened in heaven." He thought all the Bible stories took place someplace besides Earth. And so, you know, he's very young, very, very young. Uh, he's not begun elementary school yet. So, I mean, he's just easing into the knowledge of the gospel. And one of the foundational uh, pieces of the gospel is that, yes, it happened on Earth. The things that we are confessing are historical events. We believe that the resurrection of Jesus is uh, an event that happened in history. It involved the body of Jesus, the body that was conceived in Mary, that was born at Bethlehem, that was raised at Nazareth, that walked all through Galilee and Judea, that reached out and touched the sick uh, and healed the sick by touching them. Uh, the, the body that gave its, uh, himself as body and blood at the supper, that died on the cross, that's the body that was raised from the dead and that now lives with God forever. So, um, yes, it's all on earth. And 
St. Paul leads us into reflection on both that historicity and physics of resurrection, as well as the promise. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll just start at verse 1, and we'll read through, I hope, the whole chapter, uh, and talk a little bit about it as we go. So beginning at verse 1 in 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So there what he does is he actually gives a, a traditional, at, at his point already, what appears to be a traditional rendering of the history of the resurrection. And when I say traditional rendering, what I mean is there was, um, it's not just tradition in the sense of, you know, we have traditions at Christmas or something like that, but there, is, there was a tradition in the church, tradition in the sense of a body of teaching that had become standardized and was being passed down as basic to the faith from church to church to church, from generation to generation. Already by Paul's time, there had become this almost creedal way of describing what happened with the resurrection of Jesus. And so he says, you know, Christ was raised, he, he died, he's buried. A very important aspect, this is verse 4, not just that Christ died, but he was buried. And so Christ was truly dead. So dead he was buried. All right? And uh, that's why that's important to say he's, it's not as though he pretended to die on the cross and then slipped away somewhere. His body was actually stuck in the grave. And then he was raised on the third day. All of this happening in a accordance with the scriptures. So the history of the resurrection is not only rooted in the specific historical events of the resurrection of Jesus, but also in the Old Testament events, those events that are recorded in Genesis through Malachi in our Old Testament. Paul wants to remind us that that too is part of the history of this resurrection. And so then he goes on to say he appeared first to Cephas. Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. And then to the twelve, then to the rest of the disciples. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, some of whom are still alive. So Paul is now reminding us that the circle of disciples of Jesus extended, extended beyond the twelve that we see in the Gospels. Uh, that it also included these other brethren outside of that inner circle of disciples. And he cites those 500 brethren to whom the, the Lord also appeared and does so reminding us that some of them are still alive. In other words, they can be contacted. You can talk to them. You can actually hear about the resurrection from these disciples, these brethren still today. That's what Paul is saying there. We're not preaching a myth. We're not preaching a story that happened to some man off in a cave overnight, as in some religions. Instead, what's happening, what's being preached here, is something that happened publicly, that involved other people, that connects with the whole history of Israel, and that when it happened, began connecting immediately with people like Cephas, the Twelve. When he says the Twelve there, people sometimes say, well, what about Judas Iscariot? You know, Judas Iscariot certainly wasn't among the 12 to whom Jesus appeared. No, he wasn't. But remember that Paul at this point is already writing after that 12th spot had been filled 
by Matthias. After the resurrection, after Judas Iscariot had died and left the disciples having betrayed Jesus, um, the disciples replaced his position in the Twelve with another man by casting lots. And you can read about this in Acts chapter 1. And they replaced him with Matthias. Is he a legitimate number, member of the Twelve? He is indeed. Did, how, was he there when Jesus appeared to, to the Twelve, to the Eleven in the upper room? Perhaps not in the upper room. But Matthias must have been one of the 500 or one of the outer, the outer brethren to whom Christ appeared. Because we're, because we're told in Acts chapter 1 that he was with the disciples from the beginning, from the time of John the Baptist up to the present day. So he was one of those disciples outside the inner ring to whom the Lord likely appeared then after his resurrection and then was brought in as, a, as one of the 12. And that's what Paul is, is referring to there. Then he not only appeared to the 12, but also to J and the 500. So 512 witnesses so far, but also to more than 500, but also then to James, meaning the Lord's brother James, who became Bishop of Jerusalem. And then to all the apostles, meaning all the others who would eventually be commissioned by Christ to go forth and share the good news. He even appeared to Paul. Paul had this experience of meeting the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. So everything I just said involved a lot of details, involved a lot of almost minutia of history, but that's the point. The resurrection happened in the details of history. That's why I know people almost didn't mention, you know, didn't notice it at first. Um, this is why it, it, it had a specific beginning in a specific place outside Jerusalem and then spread and spread and spread very quickly. And uh, eventually, you know, took over uh, the whole Mediterranean area and parts of the Middle East, Northern Africa, uh, Arabia, uh, reaching up into, into the Caucasus region uh, and just spreading like wildfire, also reaching as far as China and India within the first few centuries after the resurrection. Um, because we don't just get there, we just don't go out there and say, isn't it a nice idea to think that we all live on? We actually go out there and say, this happened in history, and therefore you can rely on it. You may trust it. Which is also why the History Channel, um, you know, every year around Easter, starts putting out things that usually try to debunk the gospel in some way, or that try to jettison the Christian faith in some way. Uh, and so they'll, they'll, you know, have specials around Easter time about, well, who is Jesus really? And is it really what the Bible says? And maybe there's things that aren't in the Bible that tell us more about Jesus. And they always rely on texts that usually were written 100, 200 years after the things that are in the Bible that are written. But they do this every year because people are still struggling with the fact that we confess in the Christian church this actually happened. You know, if, it's what, if, if we can just say, oh, it's just sort of a myth and it's supposed to you know, change the way we think, then people can be a little bit more comfortable because then they think, well, then I'll take it or leave it as I want, as it will or will not help me. But if they say, if we say, no, this happened in history and therefore it has a claim on truth, it has a claim on ultimate reality, and it means you might actually have to not just change sort of how you think according to how you desire, but you have to change how you think and live according to the desire of another who is Lord, then that starts getting a little cagier for people, a little bit more difficult to, to bear. And so there's always been these folks who want to push back and say, oh, it's not what the Bible says. But again, the texts on which they rely to say those things usually are much later, uh, much older, or much younger, actually, than, than the biblical text. The biblical texts were written in close proximity uh, to the resurrection by those who actually knew Jesus. And now as we read further uh, at verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 15, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Jesus, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. 
For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. There, there Paul drives it home. And so apparently what was happening was that in the Corinthian congregation, there were people who wanted to start saying, there's no real resurrection of the dead. It's all kind of spiritual in our head or maybe in our hearts or something that, that there's, you know, there's life. And, um, and, and, and life is kind of a nice thing to think about. And we can kind of live as risen people. But the resurrection of the dead when we, after we die and when Jesus comes again and all that, no, that, that's not going to happen. Paul's point is, look, if there's no resurrection of the dead, if the dead stay dead, then, then Christ hasn't even been raised because Christ belongs to that category of raised from the dead. So if raised from the dead is not a thing, then Christ hasn't been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then there's no point to any of this. It happened in history. It is an event. We preach that it's a real true thing. And if it's a real true thing, then that is why we are changing how we live in anticipation of seeing him again, in anticipation of all that he promises, and in joyful obedience and faith in the fact that he has overcome the grave and even now gives us a new glorious life to live uh, by faith in his name. So it's, you know, it's really fascinating to see Paul hammer that home and not sort of say, yeah, well, you know, it's just one aspect of our faith and we can sort of compromise and we have different interpretations. You know, the resurrection is like a bright, shiny jewel with different facets. And we can all look at the different facets of the jewel and appreciate everyone's different. No, none of that stuff with Paul. It happened. Jesus' body, the body with freckles and moles that got pierced by nails and stuck with a spear, the body that wept and ate and drank, and that Mary used to carry up on the streets of Nazareth, that body is no longer in the grave. It walked around, and now it is everywhere, because God's everywhere, and that body is God. Amazing. So then reading on, at verse 20, but, and, just, and just to follow up his comment in verse 19, if we have in this life only hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Pitied, not only because we have a silly, pitied for several reasons. Pitied because what, how, how silly, how dumb, really, to think that the resurrection of Jesus means that now we can really love the world as it is. And that's the point. No, we, were, we love the world as it is um, in anticipation of how it will change. We love the world as it is because God has loved it enough to open up a future in which it will change through Christ who's raised. And so we love the world. Uh, we love the world again as it is, mercifully, compassionately, kindly, tenderheartedly, but we do so uh, because um, God has loved it so much as to open a future in, w in which it will be different. And so we don't just love things for the sake of what they are now, but for the sake of what they will be in Christ. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let me just pause immediately and talk about the word first fruits for a moment. First fruits is a agricultural term uh, also associated with the uh, worship of the Old Testament in which the first fruits, the best of the harvest, the best of the flocks and the herds were to be brought for sacrifice and offerings for the temple. So the first fruits means the best part. It's sort of like I was listening to Judge Judy the other day. Some of you know I like listen to that sometimes. It's just interesting to me to you know listen to a mind think things through like hers. And they were it was some big fight over a dog breeding, and and she and she referred to first choice, the first choice of the litter or the first pick of the litter. Did you get the first pick of the litter? Judge Judy asked. Well, that's what the first fruits is. Okay, so Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So 
Um, Christ is the is the is the first one to rise from the dead, but uh, and and that has happened because God is undoing what entered the world through a man, death and sin. Now He is undoing it through a man, and it's very interesting in the New Testament. You know, there's always these jokes around the church and in, in culture about, you know, if Eve just hadn't screwed things up, we'd all be better off or whatever. But uh, the New Testament never focuses on Eve as the origin or as the, the, the one through whom sin entered the world. There's a few places that th those references are made. But, but ultimately, it's the sin of Adam. Uh, because Adam's the first human, and that's important, because Adam was the first human being created, uh, therefore, all of human, human, the whole human race comes from him. And so including Eve, right? Because she's formed out of him. So if, this, so if Adam hadn't sinned, there would, we could still say, well, there's this part of humanity that didn't sin before Christ. But here, Paul's making the point that all of humanity now participates in this sin and death because it did, because Adam did sin. Therefore, all of humanity, the very font of humanity, the 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 what I want to call it the spring, the the headwaters of humanity sin, and so therefore now it's all come in through a man. But now it's being undone through a man, through Jesus, who is risen. And then he says, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at the coming those who belong to Christ. So Christ has been raised from the dead, and now also those who belong to him shall be raised from the dead. And giving eternal life. Then here's what happens after that, verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. And sometimes we get a little lost in the language there is subjection and subjected. But what he's saying is that Christ's rule will, is not only uh, started in the, his historical resurrection, but that it will be fulfilled in an historical event. And that historical event is this. Uh, God will actually, through Jesus, not only raise those who belong to him in the flesh, but then he will actually take care of the rest of creation too. And he will eradicate death from creation. And by eradicating death from creation, uh, what he's doing, he's undoing the, the effects of sin. And so he's undoing the weapon of Satan. And so all authority that is opposed to Christ will be undone. And all of creation will be put in subjection to God through Jesus. Uh, even Jesus, being fully man, will be in subjection to God. Jesus is God and man. Uh, and so there is this humanity of Jesus that uh, participates in, in, in the life of creation. So if creation is put in subjection to God, well, then the humanity of Christ will as well. And, and Christ will be because he is human. Uh, this is important, again, because it means that God is not a fairy tale God who gives us something nice to think about so you feel good when you die. He does do that. He does do that. But he does that because he loves the whole creation and wants to redeem the whole creation, and that day is coming. So when you look out at the trees, when you look out at the cityscape or the countryscape where you live, and you see the mountains and the skies, and when you contemplate the stars and Jupiter and the galaxies and the Milky Way and all of that, look at that and think, that's going to be different. Right now, this creation is not exactly what God wants it to be. It is in the midst of losing itself and being disintegrated and being in bondage to decay, but that's going to be undone. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be glorious. Uh, there was a, there's a preacher, Jonathan Edwards, who was an early uh, American preacher. And in one of his sermons, he says, The eye shall see colors it has never yet seen. The nose shall smell aromas it has not yet smelled. 
um, things will truly be new. Now, you know, that's, that's homiletical language, it's sermonic language, it's not exactly what we find in scripture, but, but certainly if things are going to be new, then, and, and, and yet still things, it makes sense, there'd be new colors and new aromas. So what a glorious picture to, and, and promise to contemplate, and to contemplate then also a world in which there is no conflict anymore because all things will be in subjection, subjection to God. So there will be truly a peace, the peace of heaven that transcends all understanding. Verse 29, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Um, so first of all, being baptized on behalf of the dead, that gets a little confused in our day and age because we look at a practice that we know in our day and age, which is that Mormons are baptizing people on behalf of the dead and saying that by that baptism, the dead who are not baptized as Mormons are now baptized as Mormons. That's a, that's a Mormon thing. Uh, and, and people say, oh, that must be what's happening here in 1 Corinthians. We don't know that. Uh, this is a, a practice that does not receive other mention elsewhere in the writings of the church. And what it likely means is that people were being baptized uh, in view of those whom they had loved, who were also baptized, and they were saying, oh, I want, I want what my loved one who has died is going to have. I want to share in the new creation that my loved one who has died is going to have, and therefore I'm going to be baptized also. So to be baptized on behalf of the dead likely meant they were looking at the dead ones who had been baptized heard the promises that come to them through baptism, and they said, I want that too. And now Paul is saying, what's the point of that if there's no resurrection? It makes no sense to say you want to be baptized so that you can be with the uh, those who have died before you if you're not going to see them because there's no resurrection. In fact, there is a resurrection. Over and over, he makes that point. And then he also says, and what's the point of me going through all of this if this isn't true? What's the point of me fighting with beasts at Ephesus, right? What's the point of me dying every day? What is the point of Paul pouring himself out as an apostle? That's what he's asking. If none of this is true, then let's just eat and drink and have a good old time and die. And he's saying, no, we're, we are actually engaged in a struggle and a suffering for the sake of these words. And what is the point if they aren't really true, if they're not historical? It's a good question. And so he insists on the resurrection of the dead, again, rooted in the eyewitness testimony of more than 500 people. Then he gets into this interesting passage, starting at verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not... You know, sorry, Paul, sorry for being such a fool. Well, well, he just said it. You foolish person. I mean, I want to know that question too, but he says it's kind of a foolish question. But what kind of body do they come? Well, here's his answer. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one for humans another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. Wow, that's an amazing way of describing it. So what Paul says there is he takes an image of a seed and he uses the lang agricultural language of that time to say, you sow a seed in the earth and there's a, you know, there's an immediate connection there with burial, right? You bury a grain of wheat in the earth uh, just as we place bodies who have died in the earth. And he says, just as what grows up doesn't look anything like that grain, it looks like a plant with roots and a stem and leaves and it bears even more fruit. In the same way, 
it will be for our bodies. What we know now, we're, 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 yes, you want to know about your body and the body you have now, but what the body you have now will be utterly new, so new as to bear slim resemblance to what you have now. And sometimes that scares people. But I mean, he's saying this is good. Just as a grain of wheat dies, it breaks open in the earth and then bears all kinds of more grains of wheat and a huge harvest. So also will our bodies bear this great harvest. We will increase. I don't know if that means we're going to be bigger necessarily, but we're going to increase in our humanity. One way that I think as C.S. Lewis described this is he said, uh, our bodies don't become more ghost-like in the resurrection. To the contrary, our bodies will become even more solid. If we, if we, if we take the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8 seriously, uh, where he says that we'll be liberated from our bondage to decay, and we think about the decay of our bodies, that our bodies are always in flux, our bodies are always changing, they're in motion. Um, what C.S. Lewis is getting at is he's saying that decay, that motion will will slow down in the resurrection. It, it will leave us. We will become more solid. I don't think it means we're going to become rocks. I don't know what it means. I mean, I don't know what exactly what the resurrection is going to be, but the point is new, even more human, even more what you have been meant to be from the very beginning. Mm, something to think about. And then you think about that in association with the transfiguration, Jesus shining in glory and the promise that we shall share in that glory. And so then he has this final glorious uh, imagery of saying, uh, there's one glory of the earth and one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and star differs from star in glory. And so, you know, there will be a new glory. Uh, the glory of the body that is raised will be different from the glory of the body we have now. Verse 42, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Again, he goes back to contrast the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam is what we live now, that life, the life of being a man of the dust, a human being of, of soil, carbon, the earth as it is now in bondage to decay, but, not, but then we will bear the imprint, already have been promised it by faith, but then we will bear in the flesh the imprint of the man of heaven, Jesus, the risen one. Um, so also shall we bear his glory. Verse 50, I tell you this, Oh, and then also when it says a spiritual body, I just want to pause in, about the Greek at that point. This is in, in verse uh, 44. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a, a spiritual body. Sometimes people take that to mean that we're all going to be just sort of sort of spirits. Uh, but, but what he's saying there is, and, and the term natural body is kind of a funny, a funny term, um, he's saying that right now, you know, we're, he's not saying we're going to become spirits. Uh, spirits, you know, Jesus is in the spirit and Jesus is flesh. Spirit means the way in which we live, the manner in which we live. And so we're going to live in a new manner, not a new substance. We'll still be flesh, but we'll live in a new manner. And so we're animated with soul then we shall be animated with the Holy Spirit. That's kind of what he's, he's getting. I've heard it described that one that way by one Lutheran author, but um, it's not that he's denigrating the flesh, the body of the flesh. It means that we're going to be living in, in a new way. Verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The way you live now is by flesh and blood, by the way of perishability. But behold, verse 51, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. 
For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every now and then I will hear on TV someone say something like, well, you know, the disciples thought that Jesus is risen and, and Jesus is sort of risen in spirit. He's risen in our hearts. He's risen in how we live. He's risen as an idea. Uh, he's risen as a way of life. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying he rose in the body. He appeared to people, uh, over 500 of them. If you don't think he rose in the body, there's no point being a Christian because the whole point of our faith is that this whole creation shall be liberated and inherit the same freedom that the body of Jesus has. And so in this final passage, notice he says that it's precisely the body. The body that is now perishable will put on the imperishable. The perishable body will become an imperishable body. The body now that is mortal shall become a body that is immortal. Um, and then he says that's when we'll be able to say death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Where indeed, if death can no longer affect the body, which is what it attacks, um, then it can't affect the soul either. It cannot affect creation. Then death will be swallowed up. And if death is swallowed up, then sin is swallowed up. The power of the devil is swallowed up. And there will be no conflict. There will be no um, further weeping and sorrow on the face of the earth. That's the promise that we receive because Christ is raised from the dead, the gospel that we preach this day. And it's a good word. It is a privilege to have shared it with you. And God's peace be with you as you celebrate the resurrection of the Lord.